three. So hello everyone. We've got a special guest today, second time, surprise, surprise. So it's a professor of psychology, Southern Federal University, Rostov on Don in Russia, and of course the author of Malignant Self-Love Narcissism, Revisited. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for having me a second time. You're a very brave woman. I, um, <laughs> I just have to mention by my contract, I'm sorry. I have to mention that I'm a professor of finance and professor of psychology in the outreach program of the CIAS Consortium of Universities, CIAS Center for International Advanced Professional Studies. I have a contract that says that I have to say it in every video. And whenever I don't say it, they complain. And so I don't want any trouble with them. Apologies. We don't either. So uh... yeah, yeah, you, you don't want any trouble with them, believe me. <laughs> they are Amer <laughs> Americans. Yes. You don't want any trouble. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so welcome. Welcome then. So today uh, I would love to speak with you about um, parentification, parentified children, um, how is it affect us uh, and uh, yeah, the main topic uh, around this and why it's so important and so crucial for our development. So um, yeah, uh, so maybe we can start um, to speak about what is this for our viewers or listeners that they can see uh, if they experience this or, you know, so. The problem is much bigger now because people don't grow up. Mm. Adolescence used to be defined as the years between 10 and 18. And then adolescence now is defined as the period between 10 and 25 years. Adolescence also starts three years later than in the 1980s and ends mm -hmm. three to four years later than in the 1980s. Well over one third of uh, uh, people under the age of 35 live with their parents. In many countries, it's 50%. 50% of people under age 35 live with their parents. 31% mm -hmm. of people, 31% of adults are lifelong singles. Marriage rate had collapsed by 50% between 1990 and today, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I'm trying to say are uh, people people take a fewer driving licenses, and even mm -hmm. consumption of condoms is down four to five percent a year. What I'm trying to say is people don't grow up; people remain adolescents. And they sometimes remain adolescents for life. They remain adolescents, and yet they have children because there's no license needed to be a parent. You need a license to drive a car. You need a license to drive a motorcycle. You need a license for everything, except the most important thing in life, being a parent. There, you don't need a license. So, so, the, so these people who are still mentally adolescent, they have children. And so they don't know how to raise the children. And then we have mm -hmm. the phenomenon of parentifying. Mm. I think the word parentifying is not good enough. I think the word should have been adultifying. Mm. Parentifying implies that a child is required to perform parental chores, parental roles. In other words, a child is expected to behave as a parent would. But we have a much bigger problem. Children are expected to behave as adults do because there are no adults left. No one is adult. Mm -hmm. So children are expected to behave as adults and that's why I suggest the term adultifying. Mm -hmm. At any rate, parentifying is when a child is forced. That is important to understand. It's a coercive, coercive situation. No child wants to be a parent. No child wants to be an adult. So when a child is forced by his caregivers, by people who are supposed to take care of him or her, people like mother, father, grandparents, teachers, role models, when a child is forced by caregivers to behave as an adult, to behave in what we call developmentally inappropriate role, when a child, for example, has to act as a surrogate 
parent to his siblings. Mother and father don't function, so the child has to raise, raise his brothers and sisters. That's what happened to me. I had to raise my three brothers and one sister because both my parents were mentally ill and unable to function. So I raised them. I was a parent before, before I reached the age of nine. And I continue, before I reached the age of, of, of five, and I continued to the age of 16. So that's a form of parentification. Another form of parentification is when you have, when you have to become the referee, the judge, the arbiter between two parents who are fighting. Two so parents, like, a, sorry. Oh, please go ahead. No, like a bufa, something like that, the, the rule for the child. Yes, it's like the two parents are fighting and then each one of them wants the child to support his position or her position against the other parent. And the child has to make peace. So the child becomes a peacemaker. He's always trying to find the middle ground, always trying to find a compromise, always trying to calm down everyone and so on. The next role is the, uh, as a caregiver. The child becomes a caregiver mentally or physically to, a, to the parent. So the parent, for example, can be physically disabled or mentally disabled, and the child has to take care of mommy because she is an alcoholic or because she is uh, mental, uh, physically disabled or for some other reason, she's depressed, depressive, and so never leaves bed. She stays in bed all day. So the child comes back from school and he has to take care of mommy and he has to take care of mommy or daddy as a parent. He has to parent his parents. And that's why we call it parentification. Andre Green, who was a psychoanalyst, wrote, coined in 1978, he coined the phrase dead mother. But of course you can say dead parent. It's a parent who is absent, a parent who is emotionally absent or physically absent, a parent who is depressed, self-centered, narcissistic, uh, disempathic, has no empathy for the child, capricious, a parent who is dangerous, a parent who instrumentalizes the child, uses the child as some kind of tool, um, a parent who is abusive. All these parents, these types of parents, they're dead parents. Psychodynamically, the child perceives these parents as non-existent. In every possible clinical sense, this child is an orphan. He is a virtual orphan. And so he, he copes as an orphan. And that raises another very interesting problem, and I call it self-parentifying. But I answered the first question. So <laughs> if you want, I can if you want, I can talk about self-parentifying. I just don't want to monopolize the conversation. No, it's fine. I just want to uh, maybe add that uh, I know uh, also parentification because um, I was a parentified child, but uh, in the other way, not to uh, be a parent for my parents because I didn't uh, know my father. So I was raised by other people mostly, um, but I didn't share with viewers on my channel about that. So um, like my parents, they were absent for three, three first years, years in my life. So uh, I was raised by others, just from my family or for nanny. Uh, so um, yeah, the problem uh, with me and uh, with parentification in my case was what you wrote in your last post that I want to uh, quote your, your words um, that, you, that you wrote. Um, it's a case that the child is parentified, but what can happen also? Um, they, they forced to parent itself by um, internalizing his parents like disorders, like dysfunctions, uh, attachment styles, uh, trauma bonds, and so on. So as an adult, uh, they just result their sense of self-worth by caring for others. Uh, so yeah, in a specific way, uh, we regulate, regulate emotions, but in completely different ways. And what I want to just add to this, to your words, it's like, when you cannot trust to your like you know inner object because the trust is destroyed because um, you know the 
this inner object couldn't uh, and wasn't unable to help you in a traumatic situation. So you cannot resort to your, you know, self-regulation strategies in uh, an in emergency because it has failed. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to this. And I think it's so important because I never heard about that before. Uh, so I would like to, if you can say something more about that. Yeah, some, so you made some excellent points. Um, a child needs parents. It could be a single parental figure. It could be just mother. It doesn't have to yeah. be mother and father. That's a myth. It's not true that you need a male and a female. It's, it, but you need, you need what is called in, uh, in psychology a safe base. You need a secure base. You need to feel that you have a parent who sees you sees you as you are and then loves you as you are loves you as you are doesn't mean that the parent forgives everything you do spoils you that's not loving spoiling is not loving spoiling is not allowing the child to be in touch with reality and that's not a loving thing to do but you need a parent who is present loving uh, provides feedback um, and therefore allows you to internalize social values in a process known as socialization. A parent is needed. What happens when the parent is absent, depressed, sick? What happens when there's no parent? Well, what happens is the child parents itself. The child invents a parent. If this goes to extreme situation, the child invents a false self because the false self is a parental figure. It's omniscient, it's omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, brilliant, perfect, etc., etc. It's a godlike figure. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a parental figure. But that's an extreme case. Even when the child does not become a narcissist, even when the child does not develop a false self. The child develops an imaginary friend, an imaginary friend that is actually a parental figure. The child parents itself. But how to parent yourself? The child is only four years old. It's the formative years, zero to six. The child is, is, a, is nothing, is a toddler. You know? So the child says to himself, I need a parent. I don't have a parent. OK, I will invent a parent. And now I will have a parent because I invented a parent and now everything is okay. But the child needs a model. What model will he use for the parent, the imaginary parent, the real parent? When the child invents the imaginary parent, he invents an imaginary parent that looks exactly like his real parents because he doesn't know any other parents. He has no experience with other parents. These are the parents. And now his parents have mental health issues and disorders. His parents have dysfunctional attachment styles. His parents are emotionally and psychologically immature. They are what we call puer aeternus, eternal adolescent. His parents are trauma bonded to each other, usually, and to the child sometimes. He is internalizing all this garbage when he is creating the imaginary parent, he is taking all the baggage, the sickness, the pathologies of his real parents, and he puts it into the imaginary parent because he doesn't know any other type of parent. It's the only parent he knows. From that moment on, he will have an introject. He will have an internal parent that will be inside his mind for life, for life. And this introject will parent him for life, definitely as a, as a child. And so because this parent is dysregulated, unbounded, pathologized, narcissistic, defiant, reckless, stupid, immature, you name it, it's a bad parent, not good enough parent, but bad, totally bad parent. This is the kind of parent this child will continue to have in his mind. And so he will have extreme difficulty 
not necessarily with object constancy because he will have a constant object but he will have extreme difficulty because the const the only constant constant object in his mind will be what we call a bad object it will be a bad object it will be a problematic object and so the child for example exactly as you said will not be able to regulate internally because the object the internal object the introject will be dysregulated the child will not have boundaries because the only constant internal object will be unboundary the child will interact with other people via trauma trauma is an organizing principle it's a narrative so the child will use trauma to interact with other people either he will create trauma or he will traumatize himself for example he will sacrifice himself okay. the child the child's sense of self-worth the child's sense of self-worth will depend critically on other people on caring for other people the child will feel worthless if he doesn't care for someone he he has a need a compulsive need to be needed he needs to be needed he is seen he feels alive only when he's needed only when he's caring for someone and this is of course a form of self-harm it's a form of self-mutilation not very different to borderline personality disorder the borderline cuts herself with a razor or burns herself with a cigarette this parentified child harms himself by self-sacrificing in order to care for other people in other words the parentified child when he grows up destroys himself or herself sacrifices her own well-being and happiness and regulation and everything so in order to care for other people because only then she feels alive and only then she can drown the negative voices in her head which are the internalized parents the self-parenting process is much worse much more pernicious, pernicious much more dangerous than the external parentifying. The external parentifying is a role. You can get rid of a role, it's not a big problem, but you can't get rid of the internal parent. That's the core of parentifying, in my view. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree. And, um, and then when you even spoke about that on, you know, told us, about um, this internal parentified issue then i realized when i was working on my own therapy that's why i was struggle with so many like uh, things uh, like i i want to ask it uh, a little bit um, later but uh, yeah it has a lot of uh, consequences and uh, also it's really challenge for for psyche uh, external and internal body like you can like you said already uh, we can remove the role, but it's uh, a lot of um, more complicated when it's inside. And I was also searching searching for the uh, some you know uh, research about what children, uh, the adult, let's say adult, right, parents um, choosing for this role, like you know, guardian, uh, buffer, or servants, or therapist, partner, because we've got different types, right? Uh, like Valentino wrote special maltreatment, like neglect, uh, or emotional uh, neglect, or sexual, physical, right? So, and I discovered that it's like, when it's like one child, or the eldest one, or the oldest or the most sensitive child and uh yeah and for me it just uh make more sense what was going on that inside uh in a caregivers is just a child it's much much worse than this actually if you want to go a bit deeper um it's much worse than this um uh, the initial relationship between a child and a parent was uh -huh. well described i think by melanie klein Melanie Klein's work, you can disagree, you can agree. There's a lot of fiction there. <laughs> she was a very creative, imaginary, imaginative person. <laughs> but some things she got definitely right. You, anyone who works with children knows. I raised my brothers and sisters. And I, saw it, I saw it in action. I know she's right. <clears throat> so one of the things she said 
is that the initial reaction between a child and the parent, especially mother, is via splitting, the splitting defense okay. mechanism. The child okay. splits the bad and good aspects of the mother, okay. internalizes some of these aspects and projects the other aspects on mother. If you have an internal parent, you don't have a real external parent, but you create an imaginary internal parent, you're gonna split yourself. The splitting is internalized. The minute the splitting is internalized, you become the bad object because mommy can never be a bad object. Mommy is always a good object. It's life-threatening, life-threatening to think of mother as a bad object. Imagine that you think your mother wants you dead. That's very frightening. You would never think that. You would think that something's wrong with you as a child. The child never thinks mommy is bad. Mommy is frustrating me. Mommy is evil. He never thinks this way. The child thinks, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? So when, you int when the parentified child internalizes the splitting because he has an internal parent, he splits the internal parent, he becomes 100% the bad object. From that moment, there are behavioral and, and um, affect, affective implications. For example, parentified ch children can never have fun, can never have fun. They can never, they can never indulge themselves. They can never buy themselves a gift. They can never love themselves. They can never throw themselves a party. They can never, you know, they feel guilty. They feel guilty because they are bad. They are bad and worthy objects. There is internal splitting at work. Now, as healthy people, people who were not parentified as children, the splitting stops after some time. But when you have an internal parent introject, the splitting never ever stops. You don't have to be, you don't have to have a personality disorder. You don't have to be, you can be totally healthy person otherwise, but there is internal splitting going on all the time as a background process. So you cannot love yourself, indulge yourself. You have to be self-reliant. You can't rely on other people because they're not reliable. You trust no one. You always get involved in conflicts as an arbiter, a peacemaker, or a therapist. It's, it's the role of a peacemaker. You restore inner peace to people, you know, or between people. So the child, the parentified child perceives himself as a sinner, someone who committed a sin. And now he has to redeem himself. He has to work hard to be good again. He is bad. He has to become good again. And he has to become good again by healing people, taking care of people, um, catering to the needs of people. And he has to sacrifice himself because he's bad. He has to sacrifice himself. And he never can never gratify himself or love himself or, because he's bad. And if he, he loves himself or gratifies himself or herself, then it's another sin because you should never do this with bad people. Bad people should be punished, not gratified. And part of the punishment is the constant need to feel good, worthy, trustworthy, reliable, and to self-sacrifice all the time. Essentially, the parentified child is constantly emotionally blackmailed by the introjected, by the introjected imaginary parent. All the time. There's emotional blackmail all the time. And this resembles very much, surprisingly, codependency. Codependency is exactly this type of relationship. So the child, the parentified child, when he grows up, he becomes codependent on an internal introjected parental figure, which is imaginary, invented. And then he becomes codependent on people around him. It's a reflection of his internal codependence. It's a seriously pathological dynamic. It's not a joke. I told you before we started to talk that I consider this and similar problems to be more serious than narcissism. I consider parentification, attachment problems, 
I consider them to be seriously more problematic than Nazism. I think modern, postmodern world, even so-called healthy people, they have these problems. And they don't have narcissism, but they have these problems. And these problems are destroying their relationships, making them unhappy, causing them to abuse substances, to drink, to make drugs, to do drugs. These problems are destroying them. You don't need to be a narcissist to be destroyed or to destroy others. You can just have an avoidant dismissive attachment style and you destroy other people. You can be parentified and you destroy yourself and other people because the parentified child had been coerced, had been forced to become a parent figure. So he, the parentified child does it to other people. He coerces them. He forces them. The parentified child insists that you need him. <laughs> Even if you don't need him, if you tell him, go away, I don't want you. No, you want me. You need me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to force you. To take, I'm going to force you to accept my care and loving. I'm, but I don't want you. I don't need you. I don't want you to care for me. No, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to. There's a famous movie, Misery, with okay. uh, Kathy, Kathy Bates and uh, I forgot who Dreyfus. I don't remember. There's a famous author who had a car accident. He had a car accident, and then there's this fan, fan of his work. She saves him, and she takes him to her cabin. But then. His injuries heal, he's healed, and he wants to go home. She says, no, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to love you. He says, I don't want you to love me. I don't want you to take care of me. I want to go home. No, she says, I'm going to love, I'm a fan. I admire you. I love you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of all your needs. And he says, no, she breaks his legs. She breaks his legs so that he becomes dependent on her. And she can continue to care for him. She tells him, I, I broke your legs because I love you. And I can't let you go. I need to take care of you. I need you to need me. That's a parentified child. Mm -hmm. And this is what I was um, also talking in my one of my videos about that codependent person. It's like uh, doing this all things not because uh, they love the person, right? No, because this is neurotic this is that they just have to put through your mouth this because then they feel not worthy so it's not because they are angel and i was telling this from uh, really uh from the beginning of my channel that this is also absolutely not healthy because there inside is this parentified child uh, who has totally immature caregivers or parents and sometimes this child inside is um, right hyper mature uh, or the you know uh, introject uh, parent inside and uh, absolutely agree with this you see totally. this you see this absolutely happening uh, yes um, no um, intimate partners of codependence they describe this feeling of being in a prison or being blackmailed of being, you know, because the codependent broadcasts a message. If you don't need me anymore, I will die. I will die. Mm -hmm. I can't live. I can't live without taking care of you. I'm going to take care of, I'm going to infantilize. The codependent infantilizes her partner by, by, by parentifying herself. She infantilizes the partner. And so, um, many parentified uh, children become codependents or people pleasers. And many of them are highly sensitive people, HSPs. Um, they have, they're very alert to the environment and they are super empathic and so on and so forth. But it's a mistake to think that is a positive thing because they put all this, they use all this, they leverage all these sensitivities and capabilities in order to imprison and captivate and incarcerate an intimate partner. It's a prison situation, absolutely. The, the parentified child would tend to immobilize, immobilize his intimate partner, mummify it. And in this sense, it's not much different to the narcissist. It's exactly what the narcissist does. The narcissist wants to take your life away 
so that you will never abandon him and you will always be in his shared fantasy. And the parentified child, especially the codependent parentified child, essentially wants to do the same. But the narcissist wants to do it because he wants to use you in some way, mm -hmm. sexually, otherwise. The codependent does it because he needs you to be there so that he can care, take care of you. He needs you to be there so that he can continue the parental role. The parentified child knows to do only one thing, to be a parent. He doesn't know to do anything else. He doesn't know how to behave in an intimate relationship except as a parent. So he needs you to be a child. How can he be a parent if you're not a child? So he needs you to regress. He needs you to lose your autonomy. He needs you to lose your agency. He needs you to be dependent. He wants you to be dependent because he needs to become the parent because he doesn't know any other way. And there are other similarities between parentified children and, and, uh, and codependents. And um, I'm sorry, and uh, borderlines and similar okay. pathologies, cluster B pathology. For example, um, they have this perception that they are not, um, not fully appreciated, not fully, they have this, uh, what, what you wrote to me yesterday, imposter syndrome. Yeah. So they know as children, they know that they are not parents. They are just playing at being parents. They're acting parents. They know that the parental intro introject is an imaginary parent. Even as four years old, they perceive this. So there is a constant feeling that they are acting. All the time they feel like they're acting. It's not mm -hmm. real. It's a theater. It's a kind of theater production. It's not real. They don't have a sense of reality. They're totally derealized. This severe dissociative effect of derealization. And so consequently, they feel either they feel like they are imposters, they're pretending, they fake, they fake, or they feel that they are not appropriately um, um, evaluated, appropriately uh, appreciated. So they become very passive aggressive, even they become covert narcissists, so they become so called empaths. <laughs> They become extremely, <laughs> extremely aggressive. And like borderlines exactly, they engage in compensatory behaviors. And these behaviors are not calibrated. They're not proportional. So for example, many parentified children can suddenly become recklessly promiscuous or abuse substances. And, and the reason is that there is no regulation, exactly as you said at the beginning. There's no internal regulation. And they engage in these compensatory behaviors exactly like borderline. So we see a lot of similarity between parentified children and several mental health disorders, dependent personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. Absolutely. And it's not by coincidence that many, many narcissists and borderlines were parentified children. They started life as parentified children. They didn't have proper parenting. So it's not a minor phenomenon. It's a major, major mental health issue. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you um, mentioned about that, that this uh, hypersensitive uh, people, uh, like, you know, it's not like a um, plus or something like that. And sometimes I've got this feeling that people thinking that I, I'm a highly sensitive person and it's like, but then I can see what they cannot see, uh, you know, the tragedy, tragedy, tragedy behind this, right? So um, this is um, what is showing to survive emotionally, a child really needs to set up a care system for, for a caregivers and later for a partner uh, instead of receiving it. And it, I think, yeah, this is what you said already and it's not healthy at all. They feel so, threatened when you, love, when you love the parentified child. If the parentified child grows up and you, let's mm -hmm. say you become intimate with the parentified child. When you try to love the parentified child, become adult. When you try mm -hmm. to care, or, they feel threatened because it's like you're telling mm -hmm. them you're no longer needed as parents. Mm -hmm. I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to cater to your needs. And they feel they're no mm -hmm. longer needed and you're about to abandon them. Mm -hmm. Parentified child interprets love 
being loved uh, as abandonment. So they're going to react very strangely to being loved. The, the minute you try to love a parentified child who had become an adult, he's going to walk away because he, he's going to feel that you're about to abandon him. And there is this issue of hypervigilance. Children without properly functioning parents, they develop a radar. They, they read the parent all the time. They try to read the parent. They try to see, what is she going, what is mommy going to do? What is daddy going to? So they're hypervigilant. They, all the time they scan, they scan the parental figures because they're terrified. They're simply scared. And they scan the parental figures. So they become hypervigilant. But, and they continue this all life. They constantly scan people around them. And they scan them and they say, oh, what, what do they need? How can I care for them? What are they going to do? And so there's this scanning. But on the other hand, when the child creates a parental introject, an imaginary parent, the child attributes to the imaginary parent powers and capabilities that the child does not have. Because don't forget that, I mean, I don't need to, to tell you that until a certain age, the child regards the parents as gods, as gods. They are okay. omnipotent, they can never fail, they never make mistakes. So when the child tries to create an, in, an internal parent, an imaginary parent, he creates a god. It's a private religion, he creates a god. Mm -hmm. But this god is the child, so this creates a dissonance. On the one mm -hmm. hand, the child knows that he's not godlike. He realizes his limitations. But on the other hand, part of him is godlike. So this creates enormous dissonances in parentified children when they grow up because they have this grandiose assumption that they know what you need better than you that mm -hmm. they can they can tell they can read your emotions better than you they mm -hmm. can take care of your needs before you know what you need they mm -hmm. in other words they are kind of they have supernatural abilities and this is why you have this phenomena like empaths and uh, mm. because they attribute to themselves the power, the supernatural, but paranormal power to read other people's minds and to uh, anticipate in advance what these people may require. This is of course a form of magical thinking. When the child invents an internal imaginary parent, the child engages in maximal magical thinking, and it never leaves him, and he, her or her child stays this way for life. And so, a typical parentified child—if you get married to a typical parentified child, for example—he's going to be all over you all the time, and he's going to tell you what you need and what you want and what you wish, and he's going to tell you what your priorities are, and you're going to say no, you're wrong, and he's going to say no, just don't know it. You don't, just don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. And so this gives rise, for example, in very extreme cases to what we call erotoma erotomania. Erotomania is a form of stalking where the erotomaniac stalker believes that he has access to the mind of his love object. So he, he, the, the stalker can come to a woman and say, you're in love with me, you just don't know it. Uh -huh. You just don't know it yet, but I know it. You're in love with me. It's a very dangerous situation. In extreme uh -huh. cases, this can take, this can lead to aggressive and violent action. You know, so there is this magical thinking coupled coupled with hypervigilance, which render the parentified child the perfect parent, the godlike parent. So what I'm trying to say is that the child doesn't create a realistic imaginary parent mm -hmm. he creates an idealized godlike imaginary parent which is a huge obstacle in life after the, afterwards mm -hmm. yes i i totally agree um what you said and that's why i would like to ask you another question uh you you mentioned uh, a little bit uh, about that how does that this uh, affect us what are we struggling with uh, in adult um, after when we are um, parentified? 
child. So as I said, the, there's an inability to love yourself. To in one word, I mean, in one sentence, there's an inability to love yeah. yourself. So you, mm -hmm. you would self-sacrifice, mm -hmm. you would be unable to have fun, you would not be able mm -hmm. to spoil yourself and indulge yourself or reward yourself, even if you're mm -hmm. entitled to some, some gift or something, because you had an accomplishment or you will not be able to recognize it or reward yourself. You will have essentially a sadistic, dysregulated internal parent interject which will become a kind of inner critic. And you will always feel that you're on trial. You will feel that you're bad and unworthy if you don't care for other people and fulfill their needs. Um, so you will force them. You, even if they don't want to, you will force them because otherwise you feel bad. You don't want to feel bad. The only way to not feel bad is if people accept your help and your advice and your service, even if they don't want to. <laughs> and, and so, these are dysfunctional. Now, in extreme cases, you may become a codependent, you may become a narcissist. Mm -hmm. That's what people, I think, that's what many, even scholars, fail to understand. Parent, the, the, the parentified childhood can definitely lead to conditions and disorders that look like the opposite of parenting. Mm -hmm. They look like the opposite of parenting, but they're not. Because if the internalized parent is dysfunctional, pathological, then the, par the parenting style later in life will be dysfunctional and pathological as well. Example, if the internalized parental figure is a narcissist, then the child will grow up and become a narcissist. It's the only way the child knows how to relate to other people. So there is a, a pass-through, there's a conduit it's like the pathology passes through the, the parentified child and continues. Parentified child will treat his own children the way he had been treated as a child. So he will actually force his children to parentify as well. It's an intergenerational trauma, not, not a limited to one generation. It's a form of abuse, of course, massive abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, what I uh, would like to add, uh, what I observed in my work with a clients, uh, when I see that and w working with a clients that uh, they are parentified, parentified child, uh, they also struggle with like somatization, uh, a lot of um, almost every single uh, client uh, is struggle with this uh, dissociation also, or, you know, yes, they also they don't give themselves the right to you know their own deve development or also um they feel a uh, tension chronic tension all the time in the body like to you know uh, waiting for something uh so uh yeah and they also cannot feel the pleasure of the life or you know joy yeah well, so i just, agree with you you just described the post-traumatic syndrome yeah Parentification is a trauma, and yeah. it has all the post-traumatic uh, after effects, including the ones yeah. you described. Yeah, yeah CPTSD, absolutely. So, um, the the last questions that I have for you, it's like, uh, what can we say to our viewers? How we can how they can work with day therapists, or what can they do uh, when they are listening this and they find out this is probably about me. Like, you know, what, what can we uh, tell them? There are two core issues that need to be tackled. The good news is that these issues, uh, we know how, I mean, in, in psychotherapy, we know how to tackle them in a variety of treatment modalities, not only one. Yes. We know how to tackle them and we're pretty su successful with both issues. Unlike, for example, narcissism, which, which is pretty hopeless, but this is not hopeless. Yes. So the first issue is separation individuation. Mm. We, we need to teach these people to separate from their parents, finally, at age 60 or 50 or whatever, and to, <laughs> yes. become, to become full-fledged individuals, to expel, I call it, to expel the, the parental interject. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This can be done and is frequently done in therapy. And the second thing is to develop self-love, not narcissism, self-love. Mm -hmm. 
self love is, okay. is 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 a healthy thing. I have a whole video dedicated to it. And what yes. is self love? Defining self love and so on. So, given these two, uh, a process of separa separating from the bed, from the dysfunctional parent, and becoming an individual without the parental interject, and then learning to love that individual, learning to love this core, this new core, in a in a functional, healthy way, not as not narcissistically. Um, that generally is is the path of treatment, and both things again. The optimistic message is both things are, I, I would even call them routine. It's what we do in therapy. You know, we, we may allow people to mature and to grow up. We, we play sometimes the parental figure ourselves as, as therapists. It's called trans, transference. And we allow people to, to grow up and so on. And then we teach them how to accept themselves and via self-acceptance, how to love themselves and how to treat themselves a lot more nicely than they had been treated before. Because parentified children tend to perpetuate the abuse, like all abuse victims, they continue the abuse. The internal voices of the abuser are inside their minds as introjects. And so the abuse continues long after the abuser had gone. And so we teach them to stop abusing themselves. Uh, to stop it, to just stop it and simply love themselves finally. And if necessary, by repeating certain actions ritually and without understanding what they're doing. They don't always need to understand. Insight is overrated. <laughs> Sometimes action, including somatic action, can lead to very positive results without full understanding what is happening, you know. Yeah, so, always. When I work with depressive people, for example, I tell them, you must get out of bed and you must go to the sea and you must swim. And they ask me, why? What's the connection? But I said, don't, don't ask, just get up and go to swim. That's all. So mm -hmm. same with parentified, former parentified children. Sometimes they just need to act. So they need to go to the nearest shopping mall and buy the most expensive bag they can find. That's a great form of therapy. Mm. And they need to put boundaries as to how much they care for other people and how much they cater to the needs of other people. And that includes uh, formerly parentified children who had become therapists. Not only, you know. So boundaries, yeah. boundaries are very important. So they need to say no, to learn to say no. And they need, they need to learn to not feel bad and unworthy because they had said no, because they had placed a boundary. They need to learn not to pay the emotional price of setting a boundary, et cetera, et cetera. Everything I'm saying is pretty routine and well-known. There's nothing new there. It's, there are dozens of techniques on how to accomplish each and every one of these things. So the good news is if, if the person with, who had been parentified did not develop personality pathology, then the likelihood of recovery is very high. When there are personality pathologies, we're a bit more in trouble. We're a bit more in trouble when there are addictions involved. We are also a bit more in trouble because these are intractable problems. They're very difficult to treat. But if the only problem is that you're a people pleaser and you tend to sac sacrifice yourself to take care of the needs of your children or your husband or whatever, that's it will be okay. The, the prognosis is good. Mm -hmm. I would just uh, love to add to this, uh, finish the process, of course, of separation, individuation, really crucial, I think, uh, for uh, all of us, absolutely. Mm, develop also the self-regulation. And as you said, uh, we don't have to understand to accept and doing the thing. I, I totally agree. Um, sometimes uh, to feel and pass through the morning to, to this process and sometimes also uh, when we are working with the, uh, with the body but also body psychotherapy sometimes or just body work it also helps but agree we don't have to understand everything to cope with it and to change so uh, so absolutely yes you, you, you raised a very important issue, and that's the issue of mourning and of grieving. 
Yes. Because giving up on the in introjected parental figure is like giving up on your real parents. It's, uh, yes. it's, there is a process of mourning and grieving, but more importantly, you have to give up on who you used to be. But that's every transformation. Every transformation yeah. through therapy or otherwise, through life experience, it doesn't have to be therapy, life experience, a divorce, mm -hmm. a divorce, losing a child, sometimes only traveling to another country. It's, you have to always sacrifice who you are. The main engine of personal growth and personal development is loss. Loss is the main engine. Anyone who tries to avoid loss is avoiding life and the potential of, potentials of life. We are very, we are too risk averse. We are too, too, we're trying to avoid risks too much. It's not healthy. You need pain and suffering and loss as an integral part of your evolution as a human being. If you avoid them all the time, you impair your reality testing. You no longer grasp reality properly. And you no longer have the feedback of reality, which calibrates you and allows you to gain self-awareness. So Western society especially is so focused on avoiding pain, on avoiding mm -hmm. hurt, mm -hmm. on avoiding risk, on avoiding loss, that people end up in small apartments watching Netflix. And that's all they do because everything else is so risky and there's so much pain and loss and they don't want it anymore. And that's a good definition of death, of dying. Yeah. So majority of people today are, are dead. They just don't know it yet. They, and they're dead because they gave up on life. And what did they give up on? The pain and the hurt and the loss of life. Because that's what life is. Life yes. is suffering. You don't need to embrace suffering. You don't need to seek. You don't need to elevate suffering. You don't need to make it a value. But you never, ever should avoid suffering. Because if mm -hmm. you do, if you do, you're dead. Dead people don't suffer. Last time I spoke to them. <laughs> yes, and um, thank you so much for, for this. Uh, I, I agree. Thank you, Sam, for sharing your uh, knowledge and wisdom with, with us. And um, yes, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so for much. the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you for having thank me. you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Bye. Bye.